Hello and welcome to this special edition of the CNBC debate, The Evolution of Change. I'm Martin Sung. In this edition, we'll be talking about a lot of the issues facing all of us today. We'll be joined by the CEO of DBS Bank, Piyush Gupta, and also Yuval Harari, historian, futurist, and also author of the best-selling books, Sapiens, A Brief History of Humankind, and Homo Deus, A Brief History of Tomorrow. Your first book, I'm sure many of you have read it already, Sapiens, A Brief History of, of Humankind, was about the past. Second book, Homo Deus, A Brief History of the Future, was about the time to come. Your latest book, 21 Lessons for the 21st Century, is about the here and now, which is where I want to start with you, if possible. Earlier today, you were on a panel on leadership, which made me put sort of two and two together and wonder what you thought of the age that we're in now, the age of Trump, the age of populist politics. Did you see this coming? I don't claim any special abilities to predict the, the direction of the wind in, in, in the political system uh, globally. What I can say about this new wave of populist and nationalist um, politicians is that it makes a lot of sense if you look at it from the viewpoint of individual nations. But it doesn't make much sense when you look at it from the viewpoint of humanity as a whole, of, of the whole planet. Because nationalism offers a lot of good solutions to national problems, but it has no solution to the major global problems that we are facing. And all the major problems that we are now facing are global in nature, in, mm. in their nature. Whether it's nuclear war or climate change or technological disruption, mm. you cannot solve any of these problems on the level of the nation by the acts of a single government. You must have good global cooperation in order to, to tackle all these three issues. Let me actually try and address that question a little differently. So one of your theses is that you might wind up in a world where there is a super class and then the rest of Homo sapiens. Uh, there is a view which says that a large part of the nationalism and tribalism you're seeing today is actually a manifestation of that problem, but in a much uh, lighter way, i.e. inequity. Mm. So you're already seeing a super class which is seeing a concentration of wealth and power and a much larger uh, bottom 80%, which is not sharing in the benefits of that wealth and power. The dissatisfied, and as so it So it's creating tribalism, nationalism, etc. Is what we are seeing today tip of the iceberg relative yeah. to what might come? Yeah, because today the, um, the situation is not as bad as it could be. And still you see this, this uh, wave of tribalism and nationalism and populism. Fast forward 30 years, think about the world in which a significant percentage of people have lost their jobs because of the automation revolution, in which the gaps between the rich and the poor are not just economic, they are actually biological. They can manifest in things like much longer lives for the upper classes thanks to all kinds of new and costly treatments. In such a situation, the anger will far exceed anything that we see today. So the kind of uh, global inequality that could result is one of the biggest dangers inherent in the technological disruptions I was talking about. The future that you paint in your second book, a lot of people have commented is, wow, that's just so, so dystopian, so dark, so, so brave new world. I looked at it the other way, and I, I was wondering whether or not you were being a little subversive or even cheeky by suggesting these ideas as a possible future and saying, look, folks, it doesn't necessarily have to end up like this. Yeah. Is that fair? Definitely. New technologies never mandate a single deterministic outcome. Every new technology opens several different ways to very different futures. Now, the people who usually develop the new technologies, the engineers, the startups, the, uh, the high-tech companies in places like Silicon Valley, they naturally emphasize 
the positive and optimistic scenarios about how the new technology will benefit everybody and make the world more peaceful and prosperous and so forth. And they have a point. The technologies can do that. But it, it, in order to balance this picture, it is the job of historians and philosophers and social critics mm. to point out the, more, the less optimistic scenarios. So if I can ask you, let me push back a little. When you say, on the one hand, you say technology isn't deterministic. But one of the uh, lines of thought in um, your book is that the path we are going down is actually quite inexorable because the scale and pace of the technology change, whether it's in AI or it's in robotics or nanotechnology, means that A, we are giving up free will. And there is no coordinating agency which is thinking through how do you connect the dots and what might the consequences of this be? What is deterministic is that AI and biotechnology are going to change the world. This is going to happen without any doubt. Nobody can stop it. The, 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 the power of these new technologies is just too great. And even if one country or a, a few countries completely block all further research in AI and bioengineering, other countries will continue with it. And those who stop the research, they will just be left behind. But what is not deterministic is the kind of society, the kind of world that these new technologies will create. And I don't, I don't believe that the worst case scenario is bound to happen. The narrative for the technology revolution today is being left in the hands of big technology. So private sector, Silicon Valley, etc. Is it imperative on somebody, government, civil society, or think tanks, to bring some other alternative platform to thinking about this narrative and sh shaping the discourse? Definitely. I mean, this is now the most powerful force in the world. It's going to change everything, economics, society, culture, politics, more than anything else. It is, by its very nature, a political question, and it's a very bad idea to leave it in the hands of the free market or of private businesses to regulate themselves. They don't have the necessary incentives, and frankly, they don't have the legitimacy to shape the world. Nobody elected them, nobody voted for them. They don't even pretend to represent humanity. This was the biggest question that humanity faces. Maybe ever, we are going to change life itself. We are going to create new kinds of life forms. We are going to change something that was never changed in history before, which is our own bodies and minds. We still have the same bodies and minds as in the Stone Age. All the previous political revolutions did not change this, but the new technologies will change that. The problem is that most governments are not even thinking in that direction. If you looked at the last election in the United States, so there was no discussion whatsoever about bioengineering and about artificial intelligence. Uh, the, the, the most like, technological debate, the, the, the biggest technological issue, was Hillary Clinton's emails. <laughs> and you, know, you had Donald Trump frightening people that the Mexicans will take your jobs, the Chinese will take your jobs. Nobody said the robots will take your jobs. Taking on technology, what role will sapiens have in the future? We are entering a more individualistic era. You can amass enough data on a particular person to really hack that person. Welcome to the CNBC debate, The Evolution of Change. We're talking with DBS Group CEO Piyush Gupta and the author Yuval Harari about the so-called fourth industrial revolution. That is the rise of technology and what it will mean to not only future humans, but to political systems and power balances as well. I have to ask you, okay, what we've been talking about for months, US-China trade, trade war right now with the tariffs, 
but at a much more strategic level, there's this literally fight for the future yep. over technology. Who controls technologies of the future, including AI, will have control and power. But the US is saying, look, no, we're, we don't want to give you free giveaways to our key technology. Look, one of the things that might do is it will drive China, embolden China, to literally speed up its own indigenous development. And then what happens? Yeah, we are now beginning to see kind of a new arms race yeah. for AI. Five years ago, hardly any government, except perhaps in East Asia, like the Chinese and the Koreans, thought much about AI. And now everybody is realizing that this is the big thing. And anybody left behind in the race for AI will suffer the same consequences as those who missed the train of the Industrial Revolution in the 19th century. Mm. And I think it's no coincidence that you now see China leading the race to AI because they have the national trauma of being left behind in the Industrial Revolution of the 19th century and a century and, and a half of humiliations and exploitation and, and terrible con conquests because they missed the train. Mm. And they now have like a very focused mind. This time we are leading the new revolutions. We won't be left behind again. And similarly, you have the Europeans being terrified that they are being left behind mm. in the AI race because of their concern for privacy because of their concern for individual rights and democracy and so forth. The race for developing AI to a large extent depends on amassing big data databases. And if you have a concern for privacy, individualism, democracy, this mm. is a handicap. In the meantime, places like China, this is probably one of the leading places to watch in terms of uh, uh, using technology to develop into a, uh, a surveillance uh, state, right? You mentioned Power is going to come from the ability to amass huge amounts of data, very, very personal data about yeah. individual people. And there's probably very few other places that can do this with that kind of scale than China. And it's happening right now. Yeah, I mean, in the modern age, it was the age of statistics. Now we are entering a more individualistic era in which you can get to know individuals instead of just having statistics about millions of people. You, g you can amass enough data on a particular person to really hack that person, to understand my feelings, my desires, my thoughts better than I understand myself. Mm -hmm. And then to be able not just to predict my choices and decisions, but also to manipulate me. You could show different fake news stories to different people based on their biases. In order to sway the elections, you get to know the fears and hatreds of individual people, mm -hmm. and then you use the f my fear and my hatred against me. Mm -hmm. And this is a completely different game from what we saw in the 20th century. It's based on amassing enormous amounts of data. Well, I want to uh, bring uh, Piyush in and, and ask you a question. This potentially uh, could be game-changing for, for finance, for, for, for your business, couldn't it? Uh, frankly, I think in some ways it can be game-changing for many of the business models that underlie uh, society. So you think about banking, a large part of our ability to give credit is based on the statistics you are talks about. We have broad judgments on uh, being able to figure how to give credit, maybe use credit bureaus. Yeah. But once we have information and data, which tells me that you will never pay me back, mm -hmm. but Yuval will, I will never lend to you and I will lend to Yuval. Mm -hmm. I could still do that. The problem is when you take this to other business models like insurance, the whole basis of the insurance business model is socialization of risk. Mm -hmm. We all share risk because we work off the statistical probabilities Yuval talked about, nobody knows. Mm -hmm. But the day I know that you are likely to be cancer prone because of your DNA sequencing. Would you give me a loan? And he's not. I would not insure you. Okay. But he doesn't want the insurance because he knows he will never get cancer. Ah. So the whole model of insurance broke down because now we will no longer share risk because we now know too much. And so the point that moving from statistical to individual knowledge will cause us to rethink many of our business models 
is absolutely valid. It's certainly impactful in finance, but I can see many other industrial disciplines where knowing too much might actually cause you to rethink what you want to do. Do you see the point in the near future where a lot of the technology that we've been talking about, even if it is applied for good uh, and for profit, could end up discriminating unfairly against certain individuals who may need access to your credit, for example, Absolutely. unintentionally. In, unintentionally. I yeah. think people talk about uh, technology and digital being good for financial inclusion. Mm. I think there's equally a possibility that it could lead to financial exclusion. And both outcomes are possible, so it depends on the rules of society and the rules of engagement that we craft. And therefore, in that extent, I'm in Yuval's camp. Do you agree with that, Yuval? Yeah, definitely. I mean, you can have also the problem of, you know, self-fulfilling prophecies. Like, I go to kindergarten, and they collect data on me, on how I am as a kid. Mm. And based on that, they decide not to accept me to the best school, because my record in kindergarten was not very good. Mm. I was disrupting, I was, I don't know what. So I don't go to the best school. And then when I come to university, I didn't go to the best school, and, I, and, and, and based on that, they don't accept me to the best university. And like this throughout my life, I don't get jobs, I don't get uh, uh, insurance, and it's all because I was a bad boy at, at, at kindergarten. And you get caught up in your own history. Mm. I mean, part of the advantage of the old statistical system, you faced the danger of statistical discrimination. But at least you were kind of sheltered from your own personal history. Mm. You could outgrow at least some of your mistakes and bad habits. But now you are most safe against statistical discrimination, mm -hmm. but you are unable to escape your own personal history. So this could be potentially deterministic is what you're saying. Yes, yeah. and, and you get caught up in your own personal history. Now, and you know, even worse, all this discrimination will be based probably on machine learning, on big data algorithms. You will not even know what's wrong with you. Stay with us, plenty more ahead on the CNBC debate, including many jobs are not worth saving. They are boring, they are repetitive, they are destructive to the body and the mind. What we need to really protect is not the jobs, it's the humans. Welcome back to the CNBC debate, the evolution of change. As technology advances, some say that it may usher in new economic systems that will provide millions with new sources of income and that robots and AI will do all the heavy lifting and all that could leave us with is, well, nothing to do at all. If we get to a world where AI, the superhumans, they can take care of everything and so the rest of the people really don't have too much to do. Uh, and I have two or three questions with respect to that. Question one could be, so what's wrong with that? There have been periods <laughs> in history uh, when you had uh, the feudal system uh, in the old Greek civilization where large bunches of people really did nothing. You sort of weren't born to work. The second thing is, suppose you do get to that situation, then what are the most likely jobs to be displaced? What is the first part? I mean, this might not be your expertise, but still. And uh, the third is, again, might not be expertise, but if you do get to a situation of that sort, this idea of uh, new redistributive economics, have you given any thought to this? Is there some way to think about it? There is nothing inherently wrong in jobs disappearing. Many jobs are not worth saving. They are boring, they are repetitive, they are destructive to the body and the mind. What we need to really protect is not the jobs, it's the humans. If you can protect the humans and provide them with income, with services, with meaning in life, many of the jobs of today, you don't need to protect them. Now, which jobs will disappear? Again, nobody knows. It is quite certain that a lot of jobs will disappear, especially the more monotonous and repetitive ones. Jobs that require a higher degree of creativity uh, will be safer, at least in the short term. Of course, also new jobs will be created. 
we don't know if enough, but definitely a lot of new jobs will be created. Mm. I think the big danger of, of the appearance of a useless class is not just because of the absolute lack of jobs. It's because of the difficulty in retraining and reinventing yourself. It, say you are a truck driver and you're now 50 years old and now you, you no longer have a job because all the trucks are now self-driving. But there is a new job in designing virtual reality games or in teaching yoga, whatever. And it's kind of hard to reskill. How do you <laughs> reinvent yourself at mm. age 50 after 30 years of driving a truck as a designer of virtual worlds or as a yoga teacher? Okay. It's not impossible, but it's very difficult. It demands a lot from you and also from the government, which will have to support you and, and, and to retrain you. A couple of questions coming in over my uh, iPad. Oh, I like this one. Uh, Yuval, Einstein regarded nationalism as a disease. With increasing populism and protectionism, do you think we are headed towards an era that mimics World War II? And let's layer on top of that uh, what could happen with technology as well. Well, first, I don't think that nationalism is a disease. Nationalism also has a very good side. Um, nationalism has been one of the most beneficial ideas in history because it makes strangers care about one another and cooperate to a certain extent. A nation is a community of millions of strangers, and nationalism enables these millions of strangers to, to cooperate, and, and this is very good. The problem is what happens when the nations begin to collide with one another, especially in an age like today, when to solve the major problems of the world, you need global cooperation mm. and not just national cooperation. And if we are in this situation, if your highest loyalty is to the nation, the result is likely to be trade war and real war, like the Second World War. And under current condition, this probably means the destruction of human civilization. Oh, gosh. I think we don't need to abolish nationalism, there is a, a place, an important place for national sentiments in the world. What we need is to add to the national loyalty another level of loyalty to humankind and to the world. Yeah. And people can have several loyalties at the same time. Yeah. You can be loyal to your family, to your neighborhood, to your business, to your profession, and to your nation at the same time. And you have to, to decide. Now, in this dilemma, I prefer my family over my business. Here, I prefer my business over my family. And here, I prefer my nation over my business. So contextual. Similarly, okay. you need to add another layer of loyalty also to humankind. Mm. And sometimes, you will have to prefer the interests of humankind over the interests of your nation. Okay. So that's a great segue to actually the highest voted question, which is what is your take on religion and humanity? You're arguing that sometimes humanity or your obligation to humankind is more important than the obligation to the nation or the tribe. Do you think uh, religion can be an organizing principle which helps direct some of that bigger picture thinking around humanity in the absence of other platforms? The religion, again, like any great idea, any big institution in history, it had a lot of positive and a lot of negative impact at the same time. I'm afraid that at present, most religions have become a tool in the hands of nations and governments. You see that the places where religion is strong, it's usually when a government is using religion as a kind of the handmaid of nationalism. It happens with Hinduism in India, with Judaism in Israel, with Shiite Islam in Iran, with Orthodox Christianity in Russia. Some religions really have a universal vision for humankind. But unfortunately today, religion has mainly degenerated into a kind of tool in the hands of governments and national movements. And that wraps up our CNBC debate, The Evolution of Change. I'm Martin Sung. Thanks for watching.